Well, I'll go ahead and kick this off. And what I'll do is I'll open the floor to you, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. maybe telling us who you are, bragging mm -hmm. about yourself, take the opportunity. I know it's always awkward to to talk about yourself, but people people appreciate knowing who you are and uh, understanding your background. So if you don't mind doing that, that would be great. And then we can dive into some of the questions that the audience has asked previously that you know we worked out what we would kind of go through and discuss to kind of get through things a little bit more efficiently. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so my name is Jacob, and currently I am the product manager for the Direct Live product. Um, I've been with the company for almost 10 years now. Uh, okay. I never ever thought I'd get a job in audio, especially not in Sweden. Uh, audio used to be my hobby. Uh, I've been building speakers, shit speakers, I can add, uh, because <laughs> I knew nothing back then. Uh, Me and you both. <laughs> yeah. Uh, amplifiers, good amplifiers, though. Okay. Uh, DA converters, preamps, and all of that stuff for a uh, hobby before I joined Direct. Okay. Uh, and I honestly didn't even know they existed. And that was back in 2012 when they were a small company. I was about to say tiny, but small. We were six people in the office at the time. And I believe that my title said research engineer. And of course, as is life in a company of six people, you end up doing basically everything one somehow one way or another right yeah uh, and it's been a pretty wild ride uh, today we are about 90 people i believe uh, and we have grown well not only in number of employees but in number of customers but also in the markets that we are on uh, most people know direct for the direct live product uh, in terms of revenue however that's certainly not our biggest market uh, historically, that's been smartphones, but we're also in the automotive space and headphones. Uh, and at least conceptually, we could have something for any space where you have a transducer driven by an amplifier. Okay. Yeah, I didn't realize that you guys were in mobile phones. I, I did not know that. Yeah, that's actually our biggest business and has been for seven, eight years now, maybe. Wow, okay. Yeah. So yeah, by today we are in ex in in excess of one billion smartphones. I believe wow. we used to be at least in roughly two hundred and fifty million smartphones every year with customers okay. like Oppo, Huawei, Xiaomi. Uh, wow. so and all of those are Chinese brands. So we we don't have uh, Apple or Samsung, but okay, okay, yeah. And then, of course, you have the automotive space with companies like Volvo and BMW. But again, China is most certainly an emerging market there as well. Uh, but we do have big hopes also for the room correction market. Uh, historically, perhaps the direct live product went a bit stale. That old white and blue software stayed around, stayed around <laughs> way past its best, yeah, best, best buyers. Years. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but that has been replaced. And of course, the intention with that was to be able to bring more features quicker and easier to end users. And we have also seen a pickup on the OEM side, where we today have in excess of 20 B2B uh, partners, because we don't do any hardware. So having a software solution is, of course, nice. But we need a manufacturer somewhere to actually decide to include this in order to reach customers. Uh, yeah, so like I mentioned, I started out as a research engineer. I've been writing firmware for tiny DSPs in weird equipment and everything from there to sales, marketing, and whatever you can find in between. Uh, eventually, I ended up in product management since that is a position where you need to be able to do a little bit of everything and basically try to negotiate between all the different functions in a company. And it's something that I immensely enjoy, actually. Get to oh, peek cool. into every little box. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. 
Uh, so for those of you that don't know what Dirac Live is, it is a room correction solution. Um, maybe I can show some slides about room correction. Uh, my yeah. apologies if some of you have already seen this. Well, I think it's good for everybody to, uh, to understand and get a good baseline. So let yeah. me know uh, when you are ready. So and can I full screen this, you believe? Uh, yeah, you should be able to. F11? Yep. Yeah. All right. So room correction is a curious type of product. Uh, regardless of what room correction system you're using, it doesn't have to be direct live. The procedure is conceptually the same. Um, you use a microphone. Often it comes with the equipment. Or you can source your own somehow. You connect it, again, historically to the equipment that it came with. Or in the case of Direct Live, maybe you are connecting it to the PC instead. And test tones will be played. And the room correction product that you're using is based on those measurements, try, trying to understand the situation and somehow improve it. And the reason room correction product exists is because when you place a speaker in a room, it's going to sound completely different than if, if you were listening to the same speaker in a, on a soccer field or in an anechoic chamber. Right. I'm not going to go into the details about what actually happens. You're going to have to believe me when I say that's why you <laughs> use room correction. Yeah, I think most of my audience kind of has an understanding of what yeah. happens when you put a speaker in a room. So Yeah. But the curious thing when you sit down and get philosophical about it is that you place a microphone in one or maybe multiple positions in a room, you do a bunch of measurements, and then you use software to do something, and it's supposed to sound better. And in order to start thinking about that, there is one fundamental question that needs to be answered, and that is what is good sound or better sound, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a debate that maybe I'm too young to have been involved with, but it's also something that I don't think people talk about enough. People talk about equipment or it's pixels on a TV or various parameters, but really, what is good sound? Mm -hmm. If I buy this, what will actually be better? Right. Uh, and some of it is subjective. And that, of course, is difficult to do something for through automation. And then there's other stuff. So a room correction system really needs to identify things that can be measured and that 99% of people will feel is an improvement. And the question then is, what is that? And even before room correction systems, there was speaker reviewers, for instance, in various publications. So the picture here is brazenly stolen from an online magazine that had a review for two different speakers. Mm -hmm. And they put that picture in here to make a case for something. The question is what? Mm -hmm. If I look at this red and blue trace, which one is going to sound the best? My point here is that if you measure two different speakers in the same room or in different rooms, this is the type of plots that you're going to get where you have amplitude somehow on the x-axis and on the y-axis you have frequency in hertz. So the question is then, which one is going to sound the best here? Red or blue? Well, yeah, that's that's a tough one. Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, because on, on one hand, I'm looking at it thinking, well, blue looks probably the better because it doesn't have quite the modal issues that the red one has. But yeah. to some people, the extra bass extension from the modal issue may sound better, and the extra high-frequency extension may sound better on the red. So I think yeah. it depends probably on what the, what the user is expecting and is willing to accept as a trade-off. Yeah, I would expect so too. Uh, some people say that the red one is going to be more fun, which is basically what you said. Mm -hmm. The extra bass extension is yeah, it's going to be fun. And that's the experience they want. So it's a lot to do about subjectivity. 
Uh, the question, though, does it show everything? So let's call the red one or the blue one. It doesn't matter for speaker A from some manufacturer. Then we that manufacturer releases another version of the same speaker called speaker A plus that is identical in everything except one little detail. It's going to put all music you put into it backwards. Of course, you can't build such a speaker, but let's just use our imagination for a brief while here. What would that plot look like in this picture? And the answer is, it's going to be identical. But clearly, they are going to sound different. One is going to play the music as you expect it to be, and the other one is going to play everything in reverse, starting from the end and ending at the start. But this plot is identical, because the energy content in the signal isn't changed. Right. Only the, only the timing. Right. And, and this plot doesn't care about the timing at all. Right. It only shows you how much energy is in something, but not when or basically what it's going to sound like. That's not mm. captured in here at all. And in order to talk about issues like that, uh, in audio, it's common to talk about face and face response. Uh, that's really, really difficult to interpret a face plot and try to make sense of that. Uh, another metric that is often used is the impulse response. And there is a relation between this plot, which in academia is called the magnitude response. Uh, in audio, it's often called the spectrum or the frequency response. So this plot, together with the face plot, contains the same information as the impulse response. So the impulse response is a time domain representation of the same system. It has the same information, but the representation of it is totally different. So here on the x-axis, we have time. And on the y-axis, we have amplitude, maybe in watts. It doesn't really matter. And the way the impulse response work is that you put an impulse on the input. Here, the blue signal is the input. And an impulse is a signal in digital representation. It has a 1 at time 0, and it's 0 everywhere else. And it starts at minus infinity and ends at infinity. So it's infinitely long, and it's 0 everywhere, except for one sample that is a 1. And the impulse response for a system is what that system will give you if you input an impulse like that. So in this plot, then the blue plot is the impulse itself, it's the input signal. And we have two example systems here, a red one and a green one. So the green system will delay the signal with a few samples. And it's going to reduce it by 3 dB since it's just half the height. And we can see that here because the green spike in this picture is to the right of the blue one. And the blue one is the input, right? So the output is later. So it has been delayed. And it has been reduced in amplitude. The red system, on the other hand, it's even later than the green one. It doesn't change the amplitude, but it changes the direction. So it's minus one instead of one. So it delayed the signal and it shifted the face by 180 degrees. So these are two trivial example systems and their impulse responses. Mm -hmm. And this is basically what an impulse response is. Uh, here are two other examples. So the blue one is still the input signal. The green one is a really, really simple filter, and it's a minimum phase filter. The red one is, in fact, if we look at it in the magnitude response plot, you remember the red and the uh, blue curve? Mm -hmm is going to look identical. So what many people would say, the filter response for the red and the green one 
is identical. But we can see here that the time domain behavior is totally different, where the red one, the red one is a linear phase implementation of that filter, and the green one is a minimum phase implementation of that filter. And this is a discussion we are not going to go into here, but <laughs> when people start talking about DA converters and whatnot, then there is this whole discussion about linear phase or minimum phase or some other phase. Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is that it's a time property. Mm. It's not going to change the filter response as such. And minimum phase is a very special system. For a given filter response or a magnitude plot, there are an infinite number of systems that implement that that are all different in the time domain. Or you could also say that they all have different phase responses. But there is exactly one that has what is called the least energy delay. And that is the minimum phase system. Uh, intuitively, you can think of it as the system that has as much energy as possible as soon as possible. OK. Um, in audio, for instance, you can think about that in terms of maybe a sealed versus a ported subwoofer, where intuitively many people feel that sealed subwoofers sound better. They are faster, right? And yeah, it's I'll say that. Yeah, and it's pretty much the same thing here, mm -hmm. because sealed subwoofers have more energy <laughs> early whereas ported subwoofers have higher output, but it's distributed over a longer period of time, which makes them less distinct. And of course, I'm generalizing widely here. Right. No, I, I get that. I, I think everybody else kind of does too. That's the, that's the audio trope that we've all heard numerous times, yeah. yes. Yeah. All right. So when we talk about impulse responses in rooms and... I said it's difficult to interpret a phase plot. It's equally hard to interpret an impulse response, pretty much. Mm -hmm. This is an attempt, however. And you can note that every pin in this diagram is pointing upward, because for this discussion, it doesn't really matter. Right, understood. So you have time on the x-axis and energy on the y-axis, and to the right, we can see a room, you have a speaker, and a microphone. And it basically tries to show that the very first thing that shows up on the impulse response is going to be the direct sound from the speaker, because it has the shortest path. And speed of sound is the same everywhere in your room, most likely. I would hope then, so. Yeah. <laughs> And then what happens later, slightly later, will be what is called earlier reflections. And that is, for instance, bounces behind the speaker if your speaker is placed against a wall, which they often are. They, if you sit right next to a wall, which at least here in Europe is common because homes aren't huge. So most people don't have a chair or a sofa in the middle of the room like you're supposed to do for best possible audio. Then another early reflection is going to be the direct wave bouncing in the wall behind you and then to your ears. Also, you have reflections in the ceiling and on the floor and on walls on the side. Uh, they are typically first reflections, meaning they bounce once. Um, and there isn't any hard limit for when something is an early reflection or part of the direct sound or when it's in the green area that is labeled here, late reverberation. And the reason for that is, well, there isn't one because you don't know what the speaker behaves like. 
you can't really know what's a reflection or direct sound from a single measurement point. And then, of course, there isn't only first reflections because sound is going to keep bouncing around until it's weak enough such that you can't hear it. And then you have that later area. Mm -hmm. And this is basically as much as you can say for interpreting impulse responses is that early things are going to be on the left and later things on the right. The question is, mm -hmm. what does that mean then? Um, I'll try to put this talk about impulse responses a little bit into context of Dirac Live now. Uh, so here we have two plots. The top one is A system. It is measured in nine different positions. So the blue traces are these nine different positions individually, and the black trace is the average after the different positions have been time aligned. So what we can see here is that early in the impulse responses, they are really well collected, meaning they don't deviate from each other. And then later, in this case, say after one millisecond, you can see that they start to deviate. And the reason for that, of course, is that the direct path from the speaker is going to be pretty much the same, even if you move the microphone a bit. Mm -hmm. Because it's the same speaker and you only look at the direct wave. And then as we go to the right or later in time, you're going to start catching other things that are all due to the room. The reason they are different, because the speaker is the same, the microphone is the same. The only thing that changed was the position of the microphone. So if the measurements come up different, it's going to be because it's measuring differently in that position. And it's because it's going to interact differently with the room. Uh, and now this is a really nice room. We'll have some other examples later where we can see much more nasty things going on. Um, also, what I wanted to talk here about this picture is that if you look then at the part between, say, zero and one millisecond, that is all the speaker. It has nothing to do with the room. OK, yeah. So that's this particular speaker's impulse response, and it's fairly common for a hi-fi speaker to look like that. Right. Um, it's not a huge generalization to claim that most speakers that you buy, at least, is going to look like this one way or another. Yeah, uh, it looks like a, either a two-way or it could be a three-way, depending on how the step response is shaped. But yeah, that, that looks yeah. very similar to what I'm used to seeing when I look at step responsive speakers. Yeah. So first, probably you have the tweeter, which is the sharp mm -hmm. rise there. And then you have the woofer, which is a little bit later. Right, right. And if we think back now to the earlier discussion about impulse responses and having the same filter response, so this is one impulse response. It's going to have one particular magnitude curve. But wouldn't it sound nicer if that tweeter and woofer were aligned? Maybe if the woofer was a bit faster, mm -hmm. right? And that is what we're seeing in the lower picture. That is what the direct live algorithm will give you. If you input the system above, it's going to give you the system below, right? which is the minimum phase representation of the system above, because speakers in rooms are not minimum phase. Right. So this tries to condense the energy, if you will, in time for the direct mm -hmm. wave, such that you get things you can expect to hear is that maybe you have a more what shall I call it? What's the word? Maybe, maybe better transients or? Yeah, it has to, everything. It's all about transient. I mean, people right. call the impulse response, the attack. the transient response. Yeah, I mean, you have the attack. It's, it's all those other things. Yeah. Like, well, and, and this it, is why, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, this is why, you know, I, I sent you a follow-up email asking about 
Um, and I can't remember how I worded it, but I was basically asking kind of what you pictured here is on the top, you've got a standard, we're going to say it's a two-way and not a three-way where it's wired out of polarity on the mid-range, but it's just a standard two-way. Um, so you've got the, the initial impulse of the tweeter and then a little bit, just like maybe what 0.1 millisecond or so after that, you've got the, um, the impulse of the woofer. Yeah. And what I was wondering is I had, I had seen a graphic similar to this on the bottom. And, and what I thought from seeing that was, well, they're somehow altering the impulse of the woofer to make everything line up to be at the same point. And I don't know if I was drawing the right conclusion. And I wonder if maybe if you, you could maybe possibly address that, or am I over concluding things here? No, that's implicitly what it does. It's okay. not an analyzing it and saying, oh, this is a two-way, and here we have the tweeter, and here we have the woofer. Right. Uh, and, of course, if you decide to drive those from two different outputs, so you are doing correction for the tweeter and the woofer separately, mm -hmm. it's not going to do that at all for you. Okay. So if you have a system like the above system, it's going to give you the below picture. Mm-hmm. But if you have an active multi-way speaker and you connect them to, say, a sound card and you drive them from multiple outputs on the sound card, mm -hmm. you're basically on your own. Whereas if you have yeah. one output, so Direct Live sees the whole system, it will try to make them play nice together, even though that's not, if you will, a conscious act because it doesn't look at, oh, it's a system like that one, then we're supposed to be doing this. Right. It doesn't know what it's given. It just knows. I mean, it doesn't know the system it's given. It just knows the impulse that it's get being given. So it tries to yeah. align everything. Well, and the reason I asked that specifically is because with my experience with Direct Live on the Mini DSP, CDSP, it's a car audio product. Um, when I first got that, I think, and I'm trying to remember where I read it, I was either told it by Mini DSP or it was in one of their manuals. Um, was that the best way to set that up was not to, so car audio a lot of the car audio guys that i'm i'm kind of in line with we all run active systems yeah. and uh, you know, of course we all thought well we're going to do the opposite of what the manual states which the manual says run the left side together and run the right side together don't try to run it active and then let direct live do everything just make it a stereo pair and then let direct live do it and um so we did that and i found that that actually didn't work best the interesting thing is I, I let, I'm a, I keep calling it direct. I know I'm butchering it. You'll just have to forgive me. I'm, I'm, I've tried mentally to not call it direct, but I can't, I can't not do it anymore. I've been doing it for three or four years now. No, um, maybe. Anyway, so we had tried, and I say we, a collective, had tried to just let direct run, um, like say six channels. You got a tweeter, a mid-range, and a mid-woofer uh, <laughs> for a stereo pair. And we say, all right, all right, direct, um, Tell us what the delay should be individually. And then knowing what Dirac thinks the delay should be, we go in in our DSP and we set the time delay. And then we put everything back as a stereo pair and then let it really just tweak that last little bit. And I yeah. think that's the way that most of us got the best results. And what I'm, I'm inferring from that and then this graphic is that probably was the best way to do it is to let Dirac use it as more of a, a sum speaker pair as opposed to maybe doing everything on your own actively. So in automotive situation, you are never going to get the result like the above picture here. Uh, if you decide to run them separately or if you just connect them together. And the reason for that is that in a hi-fi speaker or a speaker in your home, the tweeter and mid-range or woofer is going to be really close together, which is never basically the case in automotive. And close here doesn't only <clears throat> relate to the distance between them. Uh, perhaps even more importantly than that is the distance between the two different drive drivers or transducers and the distance to adjacent hard surfaces. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in automotive, maybe you have a tweeter in your dashboard. It's going to sit an inch and a half away from your windshield. Right. But it's going to be two feet away from your woofer. Yeah. So yeah. The How room, do you fix room, that? Yeah. <laughs> which is a huge pain in automotive. Since 
the Twitter and the woofer aren't close enough together, and especially not compared to the earlier reflections you will get. Uh, it's not really possible to, you know, compress it into right. the nice impulse response we see in the lower picture here in the automotive case. Mm -hmm. uh, and the best thing that you can do is exactly what you described. Try to get them close in time and so that you get something that at least resembles the upper picture here and then see what Dirac Live is going to do for you. Right. Then. That, yeah. And that's basically also how they work with Dirac Live in automotive uh, B2B. Okay. And they do that in the factory. Okay. Uh, the downside, of course, is that it's also the most difficult one to do. Mm. Yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah, because I'm just doing this from a an end user point of view. I can I couldn't imagine trying to do it from a, I guess a business point of view where you're trying to get everything as perfect as you can for everybody in the car. You know, I'm doing it from just one seat. Yeah. All right. So, looking then at a system, an audio system in the time domain, Direct Live tries to achieve an impulse response that is as close to minimum phase as possible, which is a very technical thing to say, but at least it looks something like that. And it's yeah. important to understand that it doesn't have anything to do with what the frequency response is looking like. That's a user control. So you decide the coloration you want to have for your system and Direct Live is going to use the measurements of your speakers in your room to get as nice an impulse response as possible. Okay. Yeah, that, that's very interesting stuff to me. I find that quite interesting because, I, would, matter of fact, I was looking at step response last night, um, trying to figure out if there was a way that I could relay uh, basically what you've shown to people. Like, here, here's what it sounds like when you're just playing, you know, mono pink noise and you delay... Uh, a tweeter, you know, a pseudo tweeter by half a millisecond or a millisecond, you know, and then it's going to change things at that crossover point and you can actually in frequency response, you can see the combing effect. So I, I think this is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, this is probably too technical. So I'm just going to mention it that it is not trivial to do this. And if you do it wrong, it's going to sound really, really bad. Mm -hmm. um, and it has a lot to do with pre-ringings and whatnot, and it's also a major reason why Direct Live requires you to do multiple measurements. Well, I understand that that's probably very technical, but that is something I would like to to talk with you about sometime later, not today, yeah. but maybe sometime later. I would like to understand, you know, maybe a little bit more about how it's able to do this because I'm looking at it thinking. What, what's going like? I can't imagine the math behind this, and then also the pring rigging aspect of it is something that kind of eludes me. I don't quite grasp that, but yeah, we'll we'll save that maybe for a different conversation another day. Yeah, uh, let's do that. I think maybe I'm gonna come back to it briefly. We'll see. Okay. Um, trying to make sense of what we just talked about. However, uh, this is an example I've been using before. So these are two different screenshots from our old software. So on the right, we have a DALI Concept 1 speaker. It's a small two-way bookshelf speaker with a five-inch woofer. And on the right, we have an unknown system. We know what we expect when we see a system and sit down and listen to it, and we can try to talk about what it sounds like. But a room correction system, again, it's a microphone recording stuff. So what can it make out of this, right? Uh, well, the left system, it has this slight slope. So maybe it's going to sound better. Maybe it's going to sound worse. We don't really know. The small bookshelf speaker seems to have a little bit more bass extension. It's going to be brighter, probably, because it doesn't have that same slope. Uh, 
other than that, it's difficult to have some kind of expectation for how they relate to each other, right? Or which one is going to sound the best. Mm -hmm. So looking then at the impulse responses for these two systems, again, we have the impulse responses from the small bookshelf on the right. Uh, we can see that the start of the impulse response looks similar to what we have on the other page. We have something that is probably the tweeter first, and we have that little bump later, which is most likely the woofer. And then we can see these areas where things seems to go wild if you look at the individual measurements compared to the average. And those are early reflections. So it looks like this system is somehow sitting close to surfaces that is reflecting sound that is close to the speaker since mm -hmm. they are so early. Uh, if we look on the unknown system then, uh, it does have a quite different direct wave. You can't really spot something like that woofer hump. So the attack is probably pretty good. If you need to make some judgment call. Mm -hmm. The room also, I would say, looks amazing. There is, for one measurement point, there seems to be some earlier reflections, but nothing that is consistent. It looks like a really nice and quiet room. Yeah, it actually does look pretty good. You can see a yeah. couple a little bit later. I'm assuming maybe ceiling and floor, but yeah, those do look pretty pretty darn good for an in-room response measurement or yeah. set of. Exactly. So, yeah, I don't know. If I had to choose, I would probably take the unknown system. But the whole purpose of this little exercise, if you will, is that it's very difficult to have expectations <laughs> based on measurements because these are the two things we were comparing, even though it was that particular speaker, but indoors. Yeah. And of course, the reflections are just too late in time, so they weren't even captured in that plot. And they are, in fact, so late that Direct Live, the consumer version, won't even see it because no one has a room that big. Yeah, okay. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. And of course, the, the distortion on your PA system is going to be much higher than your little bookshelf speaker. Mm -hmm. But you know, just looking at measurements, even if you look at the impulse response, it's really difficult to try to interpret and make sense of it. And that's the challenge of building a room correction system. You need to, you have input data from a microphone, mm -hmm. and you need to understand what is good sound and how do we get there. Right. Without trying to make something worse or inferring things that aren't really there in the first place. Yeah. Or or trust the end user, like, you know, give the end user the power to tell it what kind of system it is and hope that they know what they're doing, too. Yeah, exactly. Right. So you sent me a bunch of questions from your audience. I did. Yeah. Yeah. And these are, and these are, these yeah. are good ones. Yeah. So... Uh, there were, of course, way more questions than this. I read through them. And there were some main themes where basically the same question were asked multiple times, but maybe with a different wording. So I chose this basically on popular demand. Mm -hmm. So the first one is an interesting one, even if it's really, really technical. So online somewhere, you can probably read that Direct Live uses a combination of IIR and FIR filters. And the question is then, when is each used and why? Um, first off, what they mean. FIR filter means finite impulse response filter. So it's a filter that has an impulse response of finite length somehow. Whereas IIR filter is short for infinite impulse response. So the impulse response of an in IIR filter is, at least in theory, infinitely long. Uh, and IIR filters is pretty much where the game is at in many, many applications historically. 
Uh, the filters that you build for your speaker using coils and capacitors and resistors, they are all IIR filters. In fact, any filter that you can build using analog electronics will be an IIR filter. Uh, conversely, FIR filters, you can't build them using analog components. The only way you can have an FIR filter is in a computer or a DSP. They are, if you will, a mathematical construct. And they allow you to do things that you can't do with IIR filters. And while close enough to the truth, at least, you can do anything, an IIR filter you can do with an FIR filter. Often, it's not really worthwhile doing so. Um, for instance, if you have a really um, shallow low-pass filter that you build with a single coil or a single capacitor, implementing that with an FIR filter is going to require a whole lot of horsepower because the filter needs to be so long to get close enough to the same filter response. At the same time, it's a trivial filter if you implement it as an IR filter. Um, the filters that Direct Live designs internally are always FIR filters only. Only the filters are so long, they aren't really practically applicable in any system that people can afford or that anyone want to build for computational reasons. So the background to why we often deploy Direct Live as a combination of IR filters is it's only a practical thing that has nothing to do with audio. It's just to get the filter impulse response we need as cheaply as possible in terms of computational resources. Um, however, it must have an FIR part. You can't do it only in IIR filters. And the reason for that is, like I mentioned uh, just now, is that with FIR filters, you can implement anything that is mathematically possible, like a delay, for instance. Implementing a delay using coils and capacitors, you can't do that. But with an FIR filter, it's simple. You can have a filter that is zero everywhere, except at some point where it is one. And depending on where you place that one, you're going to get different amounts of delay. Mm, okay. it's, a it's a trivial filter. Mm -hmm. And FIR filters are the only option you have if you want to implement a non-casual, non-causal filter, meaning conceptually a filter that can look into the future a little bit, because that's what you need to do if you want to improve the impulse response. Of course, it's not really possible to look into the future, so what we're doing, or anyone that has a non-causal filter is doing, is they have a delay buffer. So you introduce a latency to the system. Okay, okay. And then the filter will look at that delay buffer so that it's no, okay, this is coming, Mm -hmm. soon. That means I need to do this now. Mm -hmm. And if you, again, are building something with coils, capacitors, and resistors, you don't really have any such mechanism such that you can act on what is going to happen soon. Right, yeah. And that concept, if you will, is what allows us to shrink the early part of the impulse response, if you will. Okay. So you can basically start moving that woofer earlier because you know it's going to start, have to start moving soon, looking at the content that it will be played soon. Mm -hmm. And from measurements, you can basically know that that woofer isn't super fast, so better get it moving now. Mm, okay. That's 
some kind of intuitive explanation of how it works. Of course, it's not only a delay because it's going to be different for different frequencies and such. Right. And the filters we end up with then will have an FIR part for the early part of the filter that have a lot of detail, and then FIR filters are excellent. Whereas the later part of the filter response have a much calmer nature, if you will, that allows them to be implemented using IIR filters. But they are also really, really long there. And of course, IIR filters are infinitely long. It's mm. very, very convenient to implement long impulse responses using IIR filters and crazy expensive to do so using FIR filters. Okay. Because the cost of FIR filters is only a function of how long the impulse response is. What the filter is doing has nothing to do with it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I, th I thought that at some point I had read that um, the combination was also more, well, more based on frequency. So like bass may get a particular filter and, and mid highs may get another particular filter. I, and I don't know if there's any truth to that or not. Yeah, well, a low pass filter with a low, low cutoff point, for instance, has an impulse response that is really, really long, mm -hmm. which makes it really expensive to implement using FIR filters. Mm -hmm. Whereas doing things in high frequencies tend to be uh, such filters have much shorter impulse responses typically right right which makes them cheaper computationally to implement using fr filters okay all right so that's well the short version of that one mm -hmm. uh, All right, and then there was also a question about room correction versus room treatment. And that's an interesting one. Um, so when I say active room correction, I mean using a room correction system like Direct Live or something else that is out there. And this is true regardless of, well, the system that you use. Right. And by passive room treatment, I mean things like diffusers and absorbers, or maybe base traps if you go all out. Yeah, if you can afford all that. Yeah, <laughs> and know how to do it, right? Yeah, no, that's true as well. And your family accepts it. That, yeah, that too. Yeah. So the best way to go about it, I would say, is to use passive room treatment to deal with things that are high up in frequencies mm -hmm. because the size of your passive room treatment equipment if you will mm -hmm. is proportional to the wavelength which is why a base trap is so much bigger than something you use to bring down something at 12k where hanging up a curtain is going to make all the difference mm -hmm. and luckily active room correction systems are typically better at dealing with things in low frequencies than in high frequencies. You remember the discussion about when in time different things happen in the impulse response. So you have the direct wave, you have the early reflections, and you have the late reverberations. So if you have a lot of high frequency energy, for instance, late in the impulse response, you can't do anything about that using room correction. What you can do is basically EQ away that part. But since it's going to be different in every single point, because the late part of an impulse response, like we saw, they deviate from each other. So you can get one point to be perfect, but mm -hmm. all the other ones are going to get way worse. Right, yeah. As soon as you move your head one way or the other, things yeah. change drastically. Exactly. But on the upside, then, you know, adding some passive room treatment that deals with high frequencies such that you don't have 8K components bouncing around for two seconds in your room, that's mm -hmm. not very intrusive. It's also not difficult or expensive. Mm -hmm. 
So the best combination would be to use passive treatment and focus on the high frequencies, and then use a room correction system to deal with the base and mid-range related stuff. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And of course, I mean, you can always go all out. Yeah. Uh, your room will not be worse if you add a ton of passive room treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question is, how much better will it be at right. some point? Because yeah. active room correction systems today are usually doing a pretty good job in the low frequencies. Right. Well, and, and I know it's a little bit off the beaten path, but you said active room correction. And I think it's important to, to di make the distinction between you know, room correction and speaker correction because a lot of people will think that they can take a bad speaker and put it in a good room and it will fix everything. And I mean, there's only so much you can do with a bad speaker. You know, once you put it in the room, it's, it's not going to, the room isn't going to make it better. No, it's not. Right. It's only ever going to make things worse. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're lucky and you find a speaker placement in a particular room and a listening position such that you enjoy it. But yeah. that's a subjective thing. You can't right. put that into, into a system, right? Mm -hmm. And then there is also a question about how does it compare to other room correction options? And depending on what the question infers, it's actually in multiple ways I'm gonna, going to cover some. Mm -hmm. I'm certain that how the question means, how does it sound different? Yeah. Uh, and the main difference really is that we do impulse response correction or face correction, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, from time to time, there are other components that claim they do. Uh, I haven't conclusively seen or heard any system that stands up to those claims. Um, I would urge people to Google by themselves. You can easily find various forums where people like yourself sit down and just measure what happens after I apply this. And regardless of the claims, other systems than Direct Live tend to do no good for your impulse response. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is that important then? Yes or no? And now that I think about it, I forgot to mention, why do I want to have a good impulse response? And if we think about it, well, you have that first example, you know, it, you will be able to tell a difference if your speaker is playing music forwards or backwards. Of course, that's not going to happen. But Assume that you have a perfect system and someone switches the polarity of a single speaker. Well, your room is still perfect, your speakers are still amazing, but your speakers are now out of phase everywhere and your stereo image will be totally ruined. And remember that phase is not a part of your magnitude plot. So you need to do phase or impulse response correction to deal with that. And that's everything to do with impulse response, which mm -hmm. is why using direct live, you will often feel that you get a better staging or you have more texture, if you will, mm -hmm. like deep, these deep male voices where you can almost envision what the signal looks like because right. it sounds so strange. Yeah. Uh, and you can't really, achieve that with any other system as far as I know or have been able to experience. Yeah. Well, and, and one thing I will say, you know, you subjectively speaking, when I first started messing around with Dirac, and this is 100% subjective, uh, I felt like, you know, the soundstage, there was more in the soundstage, you know, with the right recording, assuming that the recording relays that information correctly, the soundstage sounded better, uh, deeper, wider, there's more, you know, space in the sound stage yeah. but again that's 100 percent subjective i knew that i ran direct live and you know i was expecting some kind of change um but the other thing i'll say about timing 
and this is more for people who are curious and maybe they want to know what it sounds like. I would encourage people to really do a proper um, blind A B test between you know running Direct Live and then just your basic setup, and not only just in terms of your frequency response, but try to listen to how things are integrated. Because I can tell you that from my car audio experience, when you have the power of a DSP and you're able to just time align a, a midwoofer and a tweeter, especially if you listen to pink noise and you listen to it band limited at the crossover region you can clearly hear the difference between it coming in phase and moving out of phase. You can hear that difference. Now with music, it's it's a little bit tougher because you maybe you're expecting it, but I think the thing is too that it, just a little bit of delay, you may not notice it right away, but with pink noise, something that kind of hits everything at the same time, you can 100% tell. Um, so I, I encourage people to do a proper you know blind listening test if you can and I would almost guarantee you that the results will be better. And that's based on my own experience, not just with Direct Live, but you know my my DSP, um, car audio, and home audio stuff too. The time makes a big difference. It really does. It does. And another example where impulse response correction makes a huge difference is in movies. Uh, it's more difficult, you know blind test or a b compare because movies the audio in movies is usually not super exciting and it's changing so it's difficult you know in music you have a beat and you know it carries on the way it does but right. one piece that is out there would be from the dolby atmos test disc the rainforest one I would argue that's perhaps the best direct live demo material out there. Interesting. Okay. I've so, not heard of that one. You should, you should try to listen to that. So it's a Dolby Atmos rendering or recording, if you will, of a rainforest. And of course, since it's a rainforest, it's raining. You're sitting in a tent or maybe beneath a huge leaf or something. Mm -hmm. So you can hear the raindrops spatter above you and if you don't use direct live you are basically hearing white or pink noise but when you enable direct live and it's set up properly you're able to hear each individual raindrop mm. you can basically get a feel for how the rain gets more intense because the drops come faster and you can basically gauge the size and weight of each one. So you can tell that, okay, that particular drop, it fell from something else. It didn't come from the sky. So it was accumulating to get bigger because it got a bigger splash from it. Mm. And not only that, but you also get a true sense of immersion. Whereas if you don't use direct live, you certainly hear sound from a bunch of speakers, but you can also pinpoint the speakers. Yeah. Okay, that sound is coming from that speaker, but that's not really what you want, right? You right. want to get immersed. You don't want to hear speakers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that is all about time domain properties. To okay. That. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, try to find that one and maybe even throw it in the in a link in the description once we uh, once I post this. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if it's you know available online or something, but it's mm -hmm. on the Dolby Atmos demo disc. Okay. It's really, really old one. So I'm sure there's a bunch of them out there somewhere. Yeah. Somebody's probably got something out there somewhere. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. Uh, then there was this question, uh, what exactly is, is meant by impulse response correction? What does it do for my sound? And I believe we have talked about that. Yeah, I, I think uh, we have. Now. Yeah. But the follow-up question was, how can I, as an end user, control what it does? And the short answer to that one is that you can't. Um, the whole thing here is that you, our assumption is that people want a system that is as close to minimum phase as possible. And that's one out of an infinite number of options for a given magnitude response. So if you don't want that, then what do you want? Uh, I have still to hear a better suggestion. So what 
end user control would it be that provides a meaningful control for the end user? We haven't been able to come up with one at least. So the user control that you have in Direct Live is that you can set the target curve and that is going to determine the magnitude response that you have in your system. Mm -hmm. But there are no controls in there to control the impulse response correction directly. Okay. Yeah, so and of I, course, I, I, if I someone has a uh, you know, proposal for what they would like to control, uh, I would love to hear it. Yeah, I don't know what somebody would want to do because it sounds to me like you have the distinction between the impulse, so all of your timing is over here, and then you've got all of your magnitude frequency response aspect over here. Um, I, yeah, but that's just presentation-wise mm -hmm. because the magnitude stuff is also a part of the impulse response. Right, right, absolutely. So the data is already in there, only the representation is different. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what, what somebody would want to change <laughs> unless somebody says, I like an echoey sound. So please make the impulse responses distinct. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, add 30 milliseconds to everything or something like that. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's actually a product, not in hi fi, but, you know, uh, artificial reverbs and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Then, yeah. Yeah. DJ equipment and mm -hmm. sound boards and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But then we're outside of room correction. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. For headphones, though, uh, we see things like that popping up all over the place. But that's a completely separate topic. Yeah. I don't want to get into that. No. That, scare that scares me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. And then we have a question about changing the target curves. And why do we have to manually change it? Well, you don't have to, but maybe you want to. If you don't want to, then don't do it. But many people feel that to get the sound that they enjoy, they want to change the target curve. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but I bought the speakers I bought because I like the way they sound. They were not the expensive ones, most expensive ones in the store. It was perhaps not the fanciest brand, but I like the way they sound. Mm -hmm. And I don't want anyone to take that away from me. That's yeah. my personal preference for that's the it. type of stuff I listen to. Yeah, that's interesting that you had that, that mindset. I, mean, I wasn't really sure what I would expect somebody in your position to say, but maybe that's not quite it. Because I could almost see where you would say, hey, I, I want to go and change it to this. Uh, so it's interesting you had that mindset, and I appreciate you you putting that out there. And that's one thing, you know, the reason that I provide a lot of measurements for speakers is because to a to a very good extent, you can predict how a loudspeaker is going to perform in a room based off a set of on and off axis measurements. Um, and then the whole notion there is if you kind of have an idea of what you like already, then you can use that prediction to help guide you in the direction of, hey, this is a speaker I want, or this probably is a speaker I don't want to try out. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's difficult, but I'm sure to some extent you can do that. Yeah, uh, well, and it actually works really well. I mean, I can take a, a moving mic me method and, and measure it, my in-room response, and it lines up to the anechoic <laughs> predicted in-room response yeah. extremely well. But then it then it's the matter of going the extra step is I've got this data. Uh, what do I do with it? You know, So yeah. as a user, you're going to have to buy at least one or two of those speakers and then try to correlate it to the results and then say, yeah. yeah, I do or I don't like that sound. Now I need to go find something that does something I do or don't like, or exactly. I do like, yeah. yeah. I must admit in my case, and this was before I joined the rack actually, that I bought the speakers after giving up trying to build my own. <laughs> um, I guess my, my point is more that people have a preference. Absolutely. Everyone yes. does, even the people I'm sure that won't admit to as much. Mm -hmm. But people have a preference, and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. The, diff the diff difficult thing is trying to pin down what is it that I do like. Right. And our attempt at giving people what they want is the target curve, because there isn't any rights or wrong there. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the phase response or in the impulse response correction, we firmly believe that your system need to be as close to minimum phase as possible because what else would you want? Right, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, 
yeah. and then you choose the flavoring of the frequency response that you want. And that's exactly. the other thing too, is, you know, the, the research shows a large majority of people like a very similar sound, which is neutral on axis and neutral off axis. But then you get into the aspect of the radiation pattern of the speaker in the room and, and how that relates to the sound stage width and depth and, and those kind of factors. Uh, but not only that, then you've got to just consider the, the fact that there's always going to be trade-offs. So you may find a speaker that does A and B extremely well, but C, maybe not so much. And can you live with that trade-off versus another trade-off? Yeah. And, and then I think that's really where, so with Dirac, um, Uh, all right, and then there was several different questions about bass control. Yes, yeah, I had quite a few of those, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, Direct Live, when it was launched for room correction applications, it looks at individual outputs and does all the things we have been talking about. It allows you to set the target curve, and it will try to calculate a mixed phase filter such that the result is a system with your chosen magnitude response that is as close to minimum phase as possible. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't solve all the issues that people have when they set up an audio system. So how about base management, for instance? Uh, Dirac Live historically doesn't do base management. It doesn't know what it is and it doesn't care. It's going to do room correction for all of your speakers and then someone else figure out how to base manage that. So Dirac Live base control is going slightly in a different direction than it historically did. It is still doing all of the room correction things it always did, mm -hmm. but it's also adds then a base management option, if you will that tries to solve the good old base management problem. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is. And also in a context where you're using, for instance, Direct Live on your speakers, what are the challenges you will meet when you try to integrate one or multiple subwoofers into your systems and how we have tried to go about and solve that. So here we have three speakers and for this base control section, uh, there will be plots of a total of seven speakers for a total of a 3.4 system. So I took away some speakers just to make things simpler. So here we have LCR, so left, right, and the center speaker. And uh, they are all the same model against the same wall, measured in the same positions. In this case, it's 21 different measurement positions. Also, for all cases where we see plots here, Direct Live has been applied to the speakers. The target curve has been set to perfectly flat, not because it sounds good, but because it makes it easier to talk around these plots. Mm -hmm. No one needs to think about, but what was the target curve? Well, it was flat, just to make it easy to you know talk about them. Um, so, it doesn't really matter. Let's look at the top one, the left speaker. We can see 21 individual blue traces. We can see that the black curve, it's the average of these 21 measurements. It's perfectly flat, just like we asked for. However, if we dive in and look at any one of these 21 individual measurements, we can see that hmm, they are not super close to the average. So this is great on average if flat is what we wanted, but each individual position is different still. Uh, and of course, in higher frequencies, this has everything to do with the fact that you have multiple reflections on this uh, late reverberations. Whereas in lower frequencies, you have something that is called room modes. Uh, it's still reflections, but so I'm sure everyone here has been listening to bass somehow and walking around in the room and you will find that in one point there is no bass at all and in a different point you have way too much bass. And that's basically what we can see here in these measurements that for the same frequency you see that the bass can swing by 15, 20 dB for the same speaker in the same room. The only thing that changed was the position. 
And we also use direct life on this speaker to try to deal with the room. And that's why we see, you can see almost, maybe it's most obvious in the center speaker where you have five different groups yeah. around, what is it, 35 hertz or something like that, or is it 25? Yeah. One, two, so you have, five. yeah, 25. We have five groups with four traces in each. So you have one that is basically on the average. You have two which are below it and two which are above it. That's roughly 25 hertz. And the reason for that is the way this was measured. It was measured in a grid that is four, four by five. So five rows depth wise, that is four points wide. So in the case of all of these speakers, which is to be expected since they are against the same wall, you can see that as we move closer or further away from the speaker, the base will increase or decrease because of the modal patterns. Whereas moving sidewise doesn't change at all, which is why this is, these are clustered into groups of four. And this will happen when you place any speaker that plays bass in a room. And you have, of course, also higher up in frequency, but also in the bass, similar things that are going on. For the subwoofers, it's four of them. So one is on the same wall. It's the top left plot. It's on the same wall as um, the left, right, and center. And you can see you have the exact same behavior in the base as those speakers, which is to be expected because it's measured in the same points. It's sitting against the same wall. So of course, you have the same base problems. You have these five groups of four lines where the only difference is you're closer or further away from that wall. The lower right picture, you also see a similar pattern mm -hmm. where you have five groups of four traces. The difference is that that's against the rear wall. Okay. And the lower left and upper right plots are subwoofers that were placed on the side wall. One of them slightly in front of the listening position and one of them slightly behind the listening position. And then you can see that you don't find those exact same patterns there because the speakers are going to interact with this particular set of measurement points differently, right? The room modes are different than from the speaker on the front wall and on the rear wall. Mm -hmm. And the base management problem then becomes, how do we base manage these three speakers using these four subwoofers <laughs> as good as possible? And especially then when it comes to multi subwoofers, the reason people add more than one subwoofer usually is or should be that they want to have a more even base response, not that they want more base, right? So you, using multiple speakers, right. you can actually get the deviations from the average to be smaller. Right. You can kind of help fill in the holes by placing some of them at the other modal positions, things like yeah. that. If you know what you're doing and right. you do the sub crawl yeah. and you have a lot of patience, knowledge, yeah. maybe microphones or software too. Yeah. So a first try then would be to use Dirac Live on all seven speakers. Then if we play on them simultaneously, this is what we're going to get. So we now use seven speakers to reproduce this full range response. And if we look only in the base, this would be then the equivalent of having seven subwoofers in the room. And clearly there are still differences in low frequencies. They are smaller than before, but especially if they are at 25 Hertz, there are still huge problems. It's also interesting to note that adding two speakers that are flat doesn't equal flat. 
right? Because then the mm -hmm. average of the sum would also be flat. Right. And the reason for that is that they are not in phase. Mm -hmm. So it's the same piece of information that is missing that as in the red blue plot we had in the very beginning. So flat plus flat is not flat. So, okay, using room correction on all of your speakers and just playing in all of them at the same time is not going to give you what you want, or at least not if what you want is control over what you're going to hear and a minimized seat to seat variation. So, how about doing something else then? The first thing that we do in Dirac Lab Base Control when you do have multiple subwoofers is that you have a separate subwoofer co optimization step. And in that step, the group of all of your subwoofer will be getting additional gains and delays, as well as all pass filters designed with the purpose of minimizing the seat to seat variation. And once you have done that, you have a single input that goes into this system of filters that now controls all of your subwoofers. And you can should be able then conceptually to low pass that one, high pass your full range speaker and play on them simultaneously and get something that sounds nice. Because in the lower picture here, we can see that the individual blue traces are now really close to the black average, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks really good. Yeah. And the upper one is just the front left speaker, but high post. Mm -hmm. So doing that then, we end up with this situation where the subwoofers are playing alone, so to say. It's nice, it's exactly the way we expect it to be. But the sum is still not controlled here. So when you high pass the full range and low pass the group of subwoofers, the, they did not add up together what we wanted them to be. And also that was just for a single speaker. So the question is, how do we do that for multiple full range speakers at the same time? And the way we have chosen to deal with this is that we consider pairs of speakers. Uh, and if we, for a moment, reduce the system we're looking at to say a 2.1 two, two system, um, in stereo content, for instance, bass is typically correlated, right? Mm -hmm. You don't mix bass in stereo typically. Mm -hmm. And if the phase behavior between the left and the right speaker is going to be different at the same point, then you can't integrate your subwoofer with both of those at the same time, since they're supposed to be phase matched. But if the phase response of the left and the phase response of the right at the crossover point is different, well, then you can do it well with one of them and bad with the other one, but you can't succeed with both of them. That's not really possible. So for pairs of speakers, we calculate all pass filters such that they are, in fact, phase coherent at a crossover point. And what we try to illustrate with these two plots is that if you look at the sum of left and right, we now added the response of the two speakers together. Mm -hmm. And you can see that they cancel each other out at some points. It means right. they are out of phase. Yeah, the typical room, room suck out, right? Yeah. Looks like around 80 hertz or 70 hertz or so. Yeah, but in this case, it's due to the interaction between the left and the right speaker. Right, understood. Because this plot shows the sum of both of them playing mm -hmm. at the same time. And in the lower one, 
we look at the situation after we have applied all pass filters to make them face coherent at the crossover point. Mm -hmm. You can see that at least you don't have a suck out on average. Right. You, and, have, you got some peak there too, so. Yeah. Yeah. And the main issue here is around, what is it, 70 hertz? 70 or, or so. Yeah. Yeah. And at this point, the speakers are pretty much phase coherent at the crossover points. So it should work out fine to add a low pass filter to the subwoofers and a high pass filter to the full range speakers. Mm -hmm. And doing that, and you arrive at the upper picture here. This actually looks quite nice, but you can see we still have a slight decrease of energy at the crossover point. And that's because we only added the low pass and the high pass, but we didn't consider the phase relation between that pair of speakers and your set of subwoofers. And you can, of course, just add more energy with an EQ. But what you really want to do is to change the phase your full range speakers such that it matches the subwoofers better. Right. And then you end up with the pic the below picture. Yeah. Where you now have your target curves were set to flat. Your result when using base management is flat. And where you have multiple speakers playing, you also get a significantly reduced seat to seat variation in room. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so that's pretty darn impressive. Uh, I do have one question. Once you guys mm -hmm. figured this out and kicked this out the door, did you give yourselves a well-deserved vacation? <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, we did. <laughs> I would bet. I, I'm just curious. I mean, I don't know if you can answer this question, but if you had a guess, is there a way that you could say how long it took you from the, the initial idea of doing this to packaging it up and, and sending it out the door? I mean, are we talking like a year, two? Yeah, longer than we'd have liked to. Uh, yeah. Even then, as I'm sure some of your in your audience have been aware, it wasn't perfect when we released it. In fact, there were some issues on some types of material that we just recently fixed. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's difficult, because you're now considering what happens in my room when I play the same stuff in multiple speakers. Right, yes, yeah, it's, this it's is not difficult. trivial. It's not. Yeah, and, I mean, and, and like you said, I mean, this is not just the room, so you could take the room out of it. You could basically say, I've got two speakers out in a field somewhere, and at some point, they're gonna cause some kind of decorrelation. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's interesting stuff, though. It is, so we hope to be able to keep improving on it. Uh, the version that we will be releasing Shortly, we had a beta out for this particular issue, and I mm -hmm. believe everyone is happy with it. Okay. So it's going to be a public release, official one in the next few weeks. But you know, this stuff is never done. Well, and that it's was my not. next question: is you know, where do you see, where do you see this going in the future? Because I think most people will be satisfied with this, but I know as engineers, you know, you're always looking on how you can improve things. Yeah. That's certainly the case. Uh, but I mean, the boring stuff about business is that it must be applicable. Yeah, it's got to make it's got to make sense, right? Yes. Like yeah. we put man on the moon in the 60s. It didn't mean we kept doing it because it doesn't make sense. Why yeah. do we go there for? Right. Uh, the nice thing about this solution is that it is cheap to implement in terms of computational resources. Okay. Well, and that's something else I was wondering. So it's funny. It's kind of funny because I was thinking this has got to be pretty, you know, intensive, but maybe it's not. It's very, very intensive to calculate the filter coefficients. But mm -hmm. that was one of the main design objectives for this was that once they are calculated, the results cannot be crazy expensive to use on streaming audio because then no one can afford to implement it. People mm -hmm. are not going to add another seven DSPs to amplifiers to do this. Right. So it must be possible to fit it into the envelope of what our customers are building. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is quite impressive. Do you, yeah. So do you run something like this at your house? Not yet. Okay. Uh, I am looking to upgrade, actually. Uh, okay. I moved fairly recently. Uh-huh. Uh, still assessing exactly to where I want to go, but my I live in an apartment, mm-hmm. I should add, and I don't have a dedicated listening room or such. But my dream system would be a 544. Oh, wow. Yeah, that would be pretty awesome. I mean, my, mine right now in my home theater is just a... Um, I don't even have it at most speakers, so it's just a regular old five five dot two. And I would love, I need matter of fact, I'm like, as you're talking about this, I'm thinking I need to go upgrade my computer and go see if I can get this thing fired up because that looks awesome. Ideally, I would add another couple pair of subwoofers in, but I just don't know if I had the space. And then I do want to do Atmos because all the my friends at the Hi-Fi Daily, you know, they're always talking about Atmos speakers. And I'm like, gosh, I never cared until you guys started telling me how awesome it was. Now I now I want all these things. <laughs> yeah, definitely. What I'm most proud about with when it comes to bass control is that using multiple subwoofers now became accessible. Um, if we just go back shortly to target curves again, the way bass control works is that you don't need to set the target curve at all for your subwoofers. Rather, you set the target curve per input channel. Mm-hmm. So assume you have a 2.4 system you probably want the same target curve for your front left and front right. And then you just set the one target curve and Direct Live will figure everything out for you. Because as an end user, I don't care what the target curve is for subwoofer number three. Mm -hmm. I just want to have use the target curve to say, this is what I want. You guys go figure it out. (laughs) That's pretty funny. And that's even more impressive. Well, so then that that bears the question, you know, we talk about sometimes in audio that uh, bass is omnidirectional. Well, that's true as long as there's not phase issues. But as soon as there's a phase issue and you hear there's a null, you can hear that you can hear the null. Your ear goes straight to that null every time. Um, So that's, you know, that was going to be one of my questions is how do you determine the crossover? But I, I'm thinking it probably doesn't matter so much as long as the, the woofer is, you know, well controlled and all these things are, you know, all, all pass filters are used efficiently. So you don't have a null in that seated position and then you don't get your attention called to that subwoofer. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least up to a point. For determining the crossover point, that's something where we could probably do better in the future. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure it's super critical. Today we are on the side of caution in order not to stress the full range speakers. Mm-hmm. But the crossover point is actually a user control. Okay. So it's a part of setting the target curve. It's also deciding the crossover point. Yeah. Well, in general, I know a lot of people will... T- well, I don't know if home theater is still this way. I know that car audio was this way for a long time and home theater was is that the notion was that if you've got speakers up front, like your mains, your, your front left and right, then you would want to set the crossover on them as low as possible because the idea is that you have all the bass coming from up front. But what really happens is when you get in a real room and you've got modal issues and you've got suckouts, well, um, you can have an issue from the fronts, you know, that could actually make it sound like the bass comes from behind you. And it's the weirdest dang thing when you have stuff like that. So yeah. I, I actually am more of an advocate of using a higher than normal crossover to the subwoofer because I feel like that helps to offset the modal issues better than running speakers low and then running into dynamic range issues and things like that with the uh, with the mains. Yeah. I mean, my main reason to setting them slightly higher are exactly that, the dynamic range issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but then for the modal stuff and all that, it quickly gets really, really complicated. Yeah. And as a main u- end user, I'd rather not think about it because <laughs> I think most people are not going to be able to make any meaningful decisions based on that. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. Well, and the subwoofer crawl is a prime example. If anybody's ever tried to set up more than one subwoofer and especially go into like three or four subwoofers, then you really have to start understanding the trade-offs and, and it. you feel like there's an infinite number of potential um, ways you can set things up. And it's yeah. mind boggling. So it's it's really cool, in my opinion, at least, that Dirac is able to do that and, and figure out, yeah, you tell me what you want and I'll take care of the rest. 
Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, man. That was a marathon. Think, yeah, we covered a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, we did. I think people will uh will appreciate that. And I think that, you know, the fact that you were able to kind of pull in some of those similar questions together, hopefully that captures the majority of what everybody asked. And again, I certainly appreciate you joining me on a Saturday nonetheless and uh sitting down with me and, and hanging out for a little bit. This is cool, man. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, my pleasure. And you know, we can always do a follow up or a deep yeah. dive into some specific topic. Yeah, I have a few questions myself and I feel like they may they could be very simple answers or they could be well over my head that I wish I hadn't asked, but maybe one day I'll I'll follow up. You know, we'll wait and see what kind of questions we get off of that and then uh, I'll send you the link once I post this up mm -hmm. and then we'll go from there. I have one more question for you though. Okay. Or answer rather. Okay. It's about how it's supposed to be pronounced. Yes. Go ahead. And the short version to that is that we're a Swedish company mm -hmm. that is borrowing the name of a British physician that happened to have a French name. Oh gosh. So it's anyone's guess. <laughs> okay. Right? That Dirac, makes you feel a lot Dirac, better. Whatever. I'm sure I can't pronounce it right in the French way. Yeah. <laughs> so as long as people get what you mean, I'm sure it's fine. We just call it DL and and know that that does not stand for download. <laughs> so yeah yeah well i feel better now because i've i've heard it all sorts of ways and i thought if i'm saying it wrong i'm just saying it wrong yeah that's fine all right well cool man well once again right. i appreciate it yeah thank you yep well have a good stay one stay safe yep you too bye you too bye bye